This session will be recorded, and you are currently in a two-way audio mode. Upon joining this meeting, you agree to have your comments recorded and used in the distribution of the event replay. You will be able to unmute your speakers uh, or your microphone if you would like to ask any questions or comments during today's call. So you'll see that the uh, microphone icon is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Please make sure that you keep it muted when you're not speaking, but you can unmute it when we do get to uh, sections where you can comment. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, you can turn your feedback color to red, indicating that you need help, and I will chat with you to help you resolve those issues. I would like to call your attention to the Q&A menu option located above the content display. You can click Q&A to display the questions and answers pane. We encourage you to send your text questions at any time. Simply type your question into the field next to the Ask button and then click Ask. Please note that you may have only one question pending at a time, but you may change your question by clicking the Edit button in the Q&A pane. You can print a PDF copy of the slides by selecting the printer icon in the lower right-hand corner of your client. You will have the opportunity to give feedback by voting on polling slides during the event. When a polling slide appears, please select your answer by clicking the appropriate radio button next to the color that corresponds to your answer directly on the slide. And finally, if you haven't already, you can introduce yourself using the shared notes feature, which is the yellow notepad in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Now just one moment while I begin the recording. And now, without any further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Tracy Immel. Tracy, you now have the floor. Thank you so much, Heather, and welcome back, everybody. It's nice to see some familiar uh, names. I hope you all enjoyed the holidays, and uh, here's hoping that everyone uh, it gets to experience a very enriching and peaceful 2014. Happy New Year. So um, the first thing I'd like to do, uh, since we're short on time and we have a lot to cover, is to um, make sure that you have the rubrics uh, handy as well as the learning activities because you will need to uh, refer to those uh, during our session today. So I'm just going to pause for 10 seconds to make sure that you uh, can run if you need to or sort through some folders and get your uh, rubric um, document handy as well as the learning activities that were given for uh, homework last year. Okay. So you may remember from our last session, 21st Century Learning Design brings together the data that we gathered in that innovative teaching and learning research about how students acquire 21st century skills, what are the best practices of professional development, and what are the school level conditions that tend to enable an innovative teaching and learning uh, experience to really flourish. Those resulted, that information resulted in the development of learning activity rubrics for six different 21st century skills dimensions. And as you all know, today we'll be uh, diving in and learning about uh, collaboration and knowledge construction rubrics. We're going to go through a series of steps together to help you become more familiar with the 21st century learning design coding, as well as give you the tools that you need to evaluate your own learning activity, both the one that you submitted for um, the expert educator program, as well as the one you'll create together as part of the Learnathon. And then after the Global Forum, 
to enable you to really become great, amazing uh, mentors in with working with other teachers as they create learning activities using technology in order to enable these 21st century skills in our students. After the last session, you were asked to do some homework. Um, I have some great feedback from your community managers that says they got a lot of uh, emails and um, reflections, and, which gives me a good indication that at least a, a percentage of you uh, did the homework. But what I want to do is really check in and ask for your transparency to see how you did. So did you read the collaboration and knowledge construction rubric? and the four sample learning activities that were designed. Okay, so this is great. So for the 93% of you, um, we will be, uh, you'll have an easier time as we go through the exercises today. And for the five or six of you uh, who didn't get a chance to do it, I completely understand sometimes life gets in the way. And uh, you'll probably feel a bit rushed and a bit behind, but I want you to please feel free to uh, email me afterwards if you are needing some clarification um, or uh, want to engage uh, with me to, to get you back up to speed. So we talked a lot uh, last time about kind of the changing world of, of work and why there's so much emphasis around these 21st century skills. If you think about one third of the workforce performing in uh, work in teams across multiple locations uh, by 2013, which is now last year, that has some pretty big implications for schools school systems, educators, how we work with students in order to really prepare them for this new world of work. One of the things I know when I go and work with schools and work with educators is that many people will list collaboration as an important 21st century skill, but when we talk about it, they really don't have a good understanding of what collaboration really means how you know when it's actually happening, and how you know when it's working. And so what I want to do uh, just briefly is to ask for your thoughts. What does collaboration really mean? Um, why do you think it's important? And I'm going to ask you to use your um, feedback, uh, which is in the upper right-hand corner, to turn your seat blue if you would like to comment on the 21st century skill of collaboration, what it means and why it's important. Okay, I'm going to uh, call on Mr. Bradley uh, Smirk, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, Smirk Stick maybe. Please go ahead and unmute your phone and uh, tell us about your view on collaboration. So, hello, my name is Bradley Smurstick, and I'm chiming in here from Tampa, Florida. Uh, we work with a wide range of teachers and uh, try to give them the opportunity whenever we instruct with them to develop lessons where their students have an opportunity to collaborate in the same sense that today's rubric has them collaborating. And that would be sharing in the development of, of unique content, uh, sharing in the responsibility of the quality of that content, um, and then sharing in the uh, decisions that are made along the way that produce uh, this content that's both relevant and rigorous and uh, relates back to the challenge that the teacher gave out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Smurstick, I think you got it that way. Thank you for participating. Okay, anyone else have something to add to Bradley's comment?
Okay, well, we'll dive right in then and do some work on uh, coding, uh, our, our first learning activities. So what I'd like you to do is think about the collaboration rubric. And the first learning activity that we're going to do is uh, the house on Mango Street. And what I want you to do is to think about, uh, based on the rubric, how you would code the house on Mango Street. And remember, the rubric has five different possibilities. Are students required to work in groups or pairs? And if the answer is no, then the learning activity would get a 1. If the answer is yes, then the learning activity would get a 2. The next question would be, do they have shared responsibility? Do they make substantive decisions together? And is the work interdependent? So when you are ready, when you have in your mind what you think uh, the House on Mango Street codes, please turn your seat blue so that I know we're ready. And I'm going to give you about five minutes or less, depending on how quickly you turn your seat blue. Uh, you're coding yet? Don't worry, this takes some time. And many of the people who are uh, expert educators and who are on the call have uh, have the benefit of then uh, going through this training um, before this. So please don't feel um, shy about sharing uh, your results or badly if it's taking you uh, longer than, than others. Uh, we are all on a different path of learning. We all have different language skills, which is uh, uh, challenging because the materials are in English. So it's very understanding that it's going to take uh, some longer more than others. And what I encourage you to do is just listen to the conversation and then take your time after the call to really uh, more deeply engage with the content and understand it. Um, at the pace and, and time that you, that you need. So the goal uh, that we had was to review the House on Mango Street learning activity and to assign uh, a code to it based on the collaboration rubric. So for those of you who are ready to do the code, could you please uh, use the polling slide uh, on the slide to indicate where you believe the House on Mango Street codes. Now, one of the really important things um, about 21st century learning design is that it really isn't about getting it right. The learning actually happens in the conversation around why one person or one group might think it codes a one and why other people may think it codes at a four or a five. And so um, really I want to encourage everybody to let go of the uh, normal importance of being correct, especially when you're delivering this to uh, teachers um, as mentoring and really emphasize that the learning um, and that the coding is, uh, is, is there as a tool for collaboration and conversations to happen among educators. So what I want to start with is, um, and I'm hoping that someone who has coded uh, as a four, which means they believe that the students have made substantive uh, decisions together, is willing to share why they believe um, it, it coded at that uh, level. So is anybody uh, who is choosing green or making substantive decisions together uh, willing to share? And uh, if so, they can just unmute their mic and comment. And I'm, I'm just going to give 
30 seconds to see if, if one of those three people are willing to share. Okay, then here's what I'm going to ask. Um, would someone who uh, who coded it be willing to share, please turn your seat uh, color purple as to what you coded the activity and why. And I'm looking through my attendee list to for a purple seat. I see Sonia is on the line. Sonia, would you be willing to unmute yourself and share with the with the group? Eric, can you hear me? We can, Sonia. Thank you so much for being willing to share your thoughts about uh, the house on Mango Street and where it would code on the uh, collaboration rubric. Sure. So when I was looking through the learning activity, um, I highlighted the two areas that kind of talked about working together. And the first one was found in step two, where it says you can conduct your interview alone or with a friend, but you still have to submit separate poems. So that was the first indication that they didn't have shared responsibility. And shared responsibility means that they're turning in work that they worked on together and that that, that work was done by both of them. And so so Sonia, let me let me stop you right there. I'm going to ask you a question, actually. So um, let's walk through it from top to bottom. So the first question that we ask ourselves is, um, were students required to work in, in pairs or groups? And was that the case in this particular learning activity? Yes, it was. You'd see in question four, when the teacher was asked where they required, the, um, the box was checked that they were required and that they shared their poem to get some feedback but each one still had to submit his or her own poem. Okay, great. So then the next question we ask is, do students have shared responsibility? And you were, you were saying you believe that they do, and tell us uh, again No, I was why. saying that they do not have shared not, responsibility. Okay, they, do they don't have shared responsibility, no. and be, because? Because they each submit their own work at the end. Ah, so each student owns their own poem. They're not creating uh, an activity together. Correct. Okay, and how might the learning activity be adjusted in order to meet that bar of shared responsibility? Do you have any ideas about that? Um, well, the easiest, quickest way to do that would be to require them to the two partners to submit one poem that they jointly worked on together. Okay, so we could adjust this learning activities and have students submit a poem together in order to meet the bar of shared responsibility. Yeah. Okay, so here's a good point, I think. One of the questions that I consistently get asked um, when delivering this professional development is, should a learning activity always score a four or a five across all of the dimensions. Do you have a thought about that, Sonia? Um, I think what I work, because uh, I do this a lot with teachers teaching these rubrics, and when I say, I say sometimes you want students to work on your, their own and collaboration isn't an intended outcome. The trick is what is important for you in that learning activity? Is collaboration something that's critical, that's a, that's a learning target for that learning activity? And if it's not, if it's something that you really need to see if each individual student can do something completely on their own, then of course not. Then you might you might want that learning activity be, to be a one for collaboration. Or maybe you just want them to do some feedback, like in this situation, maybe you're teaching a lesson on uh, peer feedback, in which case that would be a two. So um, I think it's really critical to uh, not everything always needs to be a four or five. You just want to think about what is the intention of what you're trying to um, get the students to learn and what, what do you want them to demonstrate. Perfect. So think of what the learning objective is. And if the learning objective, in addition to the curriculum objective, if there's a learning objective around um, collaboration, then you would want it to score higher. 
when we code this um, this work in in other workshops, one of the things that teachers will often say is poetry is a, a, an expression. A form, a, normally, it's a form of individual expression. And so in this case, in this particular learning activity, it may not be appropriate to change it so that it can score higher because it seems that an intended outcome is a personal expression uh, through the artistic um, domain of poetry. So it might be just fine that this particular learning activity scores a two. All right, Sonia, thank you so much for your help. I really um, appreciate your willingness to come on the line um, with 150 colleagues and uh, talk about your thoughts. So, and in this case, um, the House on Mango Street does indeed score a two, as Sonia indicated, because while the students work in pairs to give each other feedback, there isn't shared ownership of the task. One student still owns the poem, and the other student is simply helping them to improve. So now let's take a look at the second learning activity um, that we uh, looked at, and that is the, uh, I'm waiting for the deck to go forward, that is the Olympic site selection. So expert educators, please uh, review the learning activity Olympic site selection with the collaboration rubric in mind and choose when you're ready what you believe it scored at. And again, these um, students do not work together it is going to end up being a, uh, a, a one. The next one will end up being a two. Shared responsibility will end up being a three. Substantive decisions a four and student work independent, interdependent, will end up being a five. And I want to encourage you to really not pay attention to what others are choosing right now and really become comfortable in what you believe this particular learning activity would score at. So again, I'm going to give us about uh, five minutes before we move on. Uh, Non-native English speakers. So uh, let's take it slowly. And if you can walk it through from uh, students required to work in pairs down through uh, wherever you think it stops, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm not a... Uh, English speaker also, so <laughs> it won't be a problem. Um, from my point of view, in this uh, in this activity, uh, I scored a four for in in collaboration, as um, and they are not uh, only required to to work in in groups. But they are also sharing the responsibility because they are, uh, they are they, one of the goals of the of the activity is to send a letter to the local council or or maybe it was like the well I don't know some somebody who has to decide where the next Olympics will 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 be held and even they have to take uh, substantial decisions and and. And the work is interdependent because uh, even their research is individual. They have to put it all together to make a one single uh, product. And this product has to be uh, uh, very high quality because it is it, going to be presented to uh, to a third person. So, so yes, I think I think it's a it's a it's a five. Sorry, is that is the the top score in collaboration. Okay, so wonderful. So students do work together in groups to do the activity. They share the responsibility for the work. They are making substantive decisions together that require negotiation. So in particular, there was a seismologist, a volcanologist, a geologist, and they all needed to integrate uh, what they were learning to reach a group decision 
about which country to recommend. And then finally, the information from each group member was required in order to make the letter to the International Olympic Committee complete. So if one person didn't complete the assignment, it would not have resulted in the same product. So their work was indeed interdependent. And it would uh, indeed for a five. So thank you so much for, uh, for helping us walk through that um, learning activity. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. And you did very well. Your English is very good. Okay, so now let's take a look at knowledge construction. And if we think about uh, knowledge construction and what that actually means and how does it contrast to the production of goods, which was really the predominant work activity in the industrial age. Um, you know, what we're asking students to do today is really to produce information and ideas together to create new solutions, new solutions around policies and laws, solutions that end up creating web apps and software, marketing strategies, design and engineering. In this particular rubric, the rubric of knowledge construction, we ask students to evaluate and synthesize, analyze and interpret information. And the strongest learning activities really require students to apply their knowledge into a different context, which really helps them deepen understanding and connect information from multiple disciplines. So what we're going to do now is, if in your books you can turn to the knowledge construction rubric, which is located on, um, well, I don't know if your book has has uh, page numbers, but um, please go to the knowledge construction rubric and take a look at the five different coding possibilities for knowledge construction. And the first uh, lesson that we're going to look at for knowledge construction is designing a catapult. So if you could please evaluate designing a catapult and choose where you believe designing a catapult lies on the knowledge construction rubric.
And if you would feel comfortable talking uh, the expert educator group through this learning activity, please change your seat to purple. And I see uh, Haddad has changed his uh, seat to purple. Haddad, if you're willing to walk us through um, this learning activity, the Design the Catapult, it would be great. You can take yourself off of mute. Haddad, are you willing to do that? You can take yourself off of mute in the upper right-hand corner. I'm going to give Haddad about 30 more seconds, and then I'll call on someone else. Hello? Yes. Haddad, hello. And hello. where are you from? I am from uh, Tunisia. Tunisia, wow. Well, welcome, and thank you so much for volunteering to take uh, this group of uh, innovative educators through um, designing a catapult uh, in the context of knowledge construction. Thank you, thank you. So, uh... so did, did the... Um, did the learning activity require knowledge construction? Yes, I think that uh, this learning activity is, uh, uh, is no longer, uh, the, the major requirement is knowledge construction. Okay, wonderful. So um, the, the main requirement was knowledge construction. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And then um, did, uh, did students apply their learning to a new context? Uh, no, I don't think that uh, student uh, uh, will, know, will uh, learn a new context. So this is something that um, I tend to get a lot of educators disagreeing about. So tell us why you believe that in this case it did not meet the bar for the application of a new learning context. Mm -hmm. Be because they uh, use uh, uh, catapult and always they, uh, they use it. So they're, while they are adjusting the catapult in order to get better results each time and they're collecting that data, they're not applying that to a new context. I think that, uh, that they uh, improve uh, this uh, catapult. Yes, yeah. okay. And mm -hmm. can, you think of a, can you think of a way that the learning activity could be improved so that instead of scoring a three, um, it mm -hmm. could actually go and hit the bar of a 
four, um, which would mean it was applied to a new context. Uh-huh. Uh... Anyone else have an idea for how uh, maybe, design maybe, had a... Yes? Go ahead. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe they uh, must choose another device, for example. Yeah, so they would, uh, if they were taking what they learned from this project and mm -hmm. applying it to create a fulcrum, for example, that might meet the requirement for applying learning to a new context. Or maybe if they took their learning and actually uh, then did a, you know, compare and contrast of Greek catapults and Roman catapults, that may actually also meet the bar for a new context. Sure. So, in general, what we see with Design a Catapult is that the students did construct knowledge about the law of levers, but the explanation they provided simply reported their observations rather than connecting it to scientific principles. And it did not demonstrate evidence of um, applying kind of age-appropriate scientific understanding to another context. So in this particular case, design a catapult would score at a three because the main requirement was knowledge construction, but the learning activity did not require students to apply their knowledge into a new context. Okay, thank you so much, Haddad. I really appreciate it. Are there anybody else that would like to add um, their thoughts around designing a catapult and um, how it scored on the knowledge construction rubric? And I just encourage you to take your phone off of mute and give us your thoughts. Okay, well, you can see kind of the way this um, professional development model works, where you become very familiar with the rubric, identifying what we mean by these terms of collaboration and knowledge construction, Hello. applying your learning to, yes, to a specific learning activity, and then adjusting your learning activity so that it can score higher in that particular uh, area. And then the idea would be then to practice that with students and to see how their learning really is enhanced uh, when you do this. Was there a comment that someone wanted to make or is it just background noise? Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, greetings then. Uh, I would just wanted to add that uh, by creating a catapult, uh, it can also be added in different fields of education. So, uh, by meaning that constructing the knowledge, uh, children can construct their knowledge in different fields. That's what I thought. So tell us how how you would see that happening. That's that's a great comment, and that would actually take the learning activity to a five if it was interdisciplinary. So how might you adjust this learning activity so that it would score a five on the rubric? Well, um, while designing it, uh, you can like use uh, like a math field. You can use like a technology field. Uh, but by using it, it's a different way of uh, like uh, involving this catapult in different fields of education. That's what I thought. In a in a math context or or possibly a technology in, context. In different like fields, like uh, seeing yes. a way of using this catapult to show different uh, meaning in different fields. Yes, absolutely. Any anybody else want to uh, add on to that? 
give another example of how they could be adjusting? Yes, I hear you. Hello. Hello. Yes, we hear you. I was just going to say right along with what the previous comment was, if you, you can bring in a really rich historical implication of all the throwing devices from medieval battles, trebuchets and ballistas and catapults and how they <laughs> affected uh, battles and how mastering that technology made one, uh, one particular uh, battle swing in the direction in favor of one army over another. Fabulous suggestion, and that absolutely would um, have them applying the learning in a different context, which would get uh, this learning activity to a four, and it would absolutely make the uh, learning activity interdisciplinary, and that would uh, then score a five. And I'm sorry, I didn't ask um, uh, the previous caller or you to introduce yourself. Could you just uh, tell us who you are and where you're from? I, that was me, Bradley. I'm in Florida once again. Oh, hi, Bradley. I'm sorry I didn't recognize your voice. That's a, a great point. And for our prior caller, um, yeah. I apologize. Oh, yes, you're still here. And your name yeah, is? Yeah. My name is Zona. I'm from Jakova, Kosovo. From Kosovo. Thank you so much, Donna, for joining us and for participating. Okay, so I know that it's a, a very brief session, and I'm very hopeful that at the Global Forum, we'll get to actually spend a bit more time doing um, one of the other rubrics. But uh, right now, really what we're trying to do is to just give you a very high-level overview so that you can then um, spend some time in between calls learning a little bit more depth uh, about each of these rubrics, learning from the other people on the call, and applying it to your own learning activity um, that you created for the expert educator. We're not going to have time to go through um, the next learning activity. I want to make sure that we get set up for our February session. And as we went through this session, I already have some uh, ideas for how we can make these calls more efficient so that we'll be able to spend more time talking about the, the learning. So for next session, which is February 5th, we're going to um, ask you to adjust your learning activity based on uh, collaboration and the knowledge construction rubric. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is to collaborate with your uh, communities, um, managers in your groups on um, asking their advice and, and seeing if they have ideas if you get stuck or, um, you know, you'd, you'd really like to work more on these two rubrics between now and then. Try it out with your students. Um, if you have a smaller lesson, I know many of you submitted learning activities that were uh, over multiple class sessions, and so it wouldn't be necessarily possible for you to do this particular learning activity. But if you're meeting with students, take a small learning activity and use the rubrics and adjust it and see what happens to students. What do you notice? Capture that learning in your 21st century uh, journal if self-reflection uh, and journaling is a good learning tool for you. And then in preparation for the next session, I'd like to ask you to uh, read the uh, real-world problem solving and use of ICT or technology uh, for learning rubrics. And the four uh, following learning activities, the Great Train Internet, Olympic Site Selection, House on Mango Street, and Doing Business in Birmingham. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to please have these learning activities scored before we come to the, 20, to the next session, before we come to the February 5th session. Um, go ahead and score these learning activities using the rubrics of real-world problem solving and the use of ICT for learning. And have an idea of why you believe they score that way. And I think that that will create an opportunity for more people to participate uh, on the next call. So um, with that, I do have a few minutes for any comments or questions. Um, 
please go ahead and uh, you can unmute yourself, yes, if you have a comment or question. And then I will be turning um, the call over in a few minutes to uh, Taryn Benaroche, who can um, answer any additional questions on the forum. Uh, so any anybody right now, comments or questions on 21st century learning design? Hello. Hello. Can you listen to me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yes. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. I am Ana Lucia from Guatemala. I just have a question. I have my learning activity, but I really, I really don't know if I can repeat it because I have new students this year. So how am I supposed to work with it? So what I would suggest, um, Lucia, and thank you for uh, – for uh, your question, is you may want to adjust the learning activity um, for the uh, global forum because that's, these rubrics are going to be one way that the judges are evaluating both the learning activities that you already submitted as well as your learnathon activities. What I'm suggesting is that if you have a, a small lesson that you're delivering with students over the coming months, Go ahead and adjust that lesson so that you can actually see what happens when you um, do that uh, in the classroom. So that's what I would suggest. Is just do it, you know, use the rubric to adjust uh, a lesson that you'll be delivering in the next uh, coming weeks. Okay, so just to make it clear, <laughs> uh, so my activity, I'm just going to adapt it for the. Uh, for the forum, right? And I yes. can do another one with my new students to put it, the, all these things into practice, right? Absolutely, because this is about oh, okay. your yeah. own learning and about how uh, adjusting these learning activities impact oh, okay. students. So we'd love for you to see what actually happens when uh, you adjust your learning activities and practice it with students. Because that's, I know, there is a goal to do really well at the Globum Forum, but the ultimate goal is to impact the students in your classroom. So Definitely. absolutely, you've got it exactly right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Any other questions or comments? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Please introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Yes, uh, no, my name is Dalian Yunus from Kuwait. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, just I have a question. Um, we are required to discuss the learning activities with our students, right, before the uh, before February 5th. But we have a midterm holiday uh, starting from the uh, uh, January 30th to uh, February 13th. So we will not be able to uh, to find our students uh, to discuss it with them. So, so can we just? Please, please consider um, these homework assignments uh, suggestions, with the exception of coming to the webcast prepared to um, to discuss coding of the learning activity. So, if your students are on holiday, you can't control that. Um, make an adjustment to, to to a lesson that you'll be using after the holiday. So, please don't stress about it too much. I know how busy educators are. Uh, the idea is, uh, and the encouragement is, to put these things in practice with your students as soon as you can. Okay, because we have a discussion to be on the, uh, February 5th and February 8th, right? So we need to get, be ready before that. Um, February 5th is the, the next, um, where we'll be doing the next two uh, rubrics. And you won't be required to have done anything with your students. So, um, thank you. okay. Let me say thank something. you very much. Thank you. Yes, of course. I have someone else on the line. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello. I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Hanin from Tunisia. Just, I want to ask you if the activity that we need to adjust, is it in relation to the one that we have proposed in the, for the global forum, or just we propose uh, any activity from our lessons? 
I think the answer is yes. <laughs> and what that means is if you believe you can improve the lesson that you submitted to the Global Forum, we encourage you to make some adjustments to it. It will help you uh, do better at the forum because the judges will be using the 21st century learning design as a criteria. And as important, if not more important, is to practice this learning going forward with your students. As you do lessons with your students where you want to encourage these 21st century skills, as Sonia indicated, if the learning objective has uh, collaboration or knowledge construction in mind, try to make some small adjustments to your learning activities so that you can put the practice um, into action uh, with your students. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Tracy, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Razan, but we do need to move on. And I would suggest if, Absolutely. Um, if anyone else have any questions, please, please feel free to ask on the Q&A pane or feel free to email your community manager. Yes, and I will stay on uh, and answer questions in the Q&A uh, pane. So thank you so much, uh, everybody, and I appreciate your patience as we try out this professional development in this online uh, environment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tracy. I, I love sitting through these. Even though I've, I've been through some of these workshops, I seem to learn things all over again, and it makes me miss my classroom, I must say. So, um, and thank you all. Um, I wanted to briefly, I know we're doing a lot of thanking to you, but uh, as a former teacher, I know how much work your regular life is and how much work goes into managing a classroom and for those trainers out there, training your teachers. Um, and I can't tell you how encouraging and inspiring it is to see so many educators gathered that uh, in, in search of more professional learning. So uh, the time that we spend here is going to pay off, I think, in your classroom, and we hope that it's beneficial to you. I know that um, we've had fantastic feedback from you on the 21st century skills learning, and um, we're really excited to keep working with you. So um, thank you for keeping on, as I know that there's a lot that you have to do already. Um, so that said, I am very, very excited to be here today. Um, as you know, my name is Taryn Benaroche. Excuse me. I, uh, of course, run our teacher programs here at Microsoft. And what we're going to do um, in this last part of the uh, the call is talk a little bit more about the operational pieces of the global forum. We've gotten through the pedagogical content. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Learnathon and some uh, of the operational pieces of what the Global Forum will look like in more detail. Um, so as you see, uh, we have gotten through our two of our webinars, and what's coming up is our third and final webinar before the forum on February 5th, um, and I'll go through what, what will be included on that. Uh, in addition, I want to make a quick plug and reminder to read the playbook that we have set out for you. A lot of you have, and as I mentioned before, I know some of our Latin American expert educators have translated that. Um, if we have other languages, we'd be happy to, to showcase those as well. Um, additionally, if you have not submitted your action plan, please do so to your community manager as soon as you can. So those are the, the housekeeping things. So um, I'd like to talk to you about the Learnathon today. Um, I'm gonna. This is a reminder of what the Global Forum will look like. Um, you're arriving on March 10th, and then the first two days will encompass the judging for the digital story that we discussed on our last call in Jan in uh, December. Um, so there's going to be some team building and professional development. Tracy will be back um, doing a reminder and refresher on 21 CLD. And then the rest of those days are, again, to remind you, um, for the digital story judging. So this is the learning activity that you submitted with your application. Now, I've had a lot of questions about what's happening on the last two days, March 13 and 14, which is our Learnathon. So um, to clarify one thing, um, in response to a number of questions, people are asking about what are the categories that you're going to be judged on and competing? And there are two main competitions. One is, as we said, the digital story. 
Um, and those will have separate judging. There are going to be 10 prizes in the digital story and the personal project. There's going to be <coughs> a one, one winner, <coughs> excuse me, one winner and one runner up in each of the categories that are listed here. In addition, you'll have a chance to win prize, a prize in the Learnathon. There will be nine, uh, group prizes, group prizes, one winner and two runners up for each of the three categories. So, then, now that we have that, what is the Learnathon? What exactly are we going to do? So basically, the idea was spurred from years of our Partners in Learning Global Forum where many of our educators felt like they didn't have a lot of time to collaborate with each other and to put some of their professional learnings immediately into practice. So that's uh, where the Learnathon idea was born. It's going to be a 24-hour activity where you're going to be divided into groups. Um, and you're going to be issued a challenge based on three categories, poverty, gender equality, and the environment. And you're expected to create with your group a new learning activity that could be ready to be used in your school or with your, um, if you're a trainer, with your teachers going forward. Um, and the idea is that it's collaborative, that all of us, <coughs> pardon me, um, that all of you will be working together in these groups, um, again, walking the walk of 21st century skills, um, and it gives you an opportunity to learn from folks in different countries. Um, the Learnathon activity needs to be in English. Um, for those of you, once we divide you into groups, we're dividing you based on language skills and language abilities so that you will be able to communicate both with each other and with the judges. Um, but the, the learning activity in the end needs to be in English. Um, if you have questions about the language barriers, once we've divided you into groups, we will work with your community managers to make sure everyone can communicate with each other. All the learnathon work will be done on the day of March 13th and be done in the themes of that I just described. Um, we're going to be, so you will be selecting two themes that apply, apply to your group learning activity. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me, you'll pardon me for being uh, very sick. As you might have seen, there's a big cold snap in the U.S. right now, and I'm getting over a cold. Um, each group, once you've um, gotten together and, and made your learning activity, each group will have 10 minutes to present this to a panel of judges on the 14th. And again, that presentation needs to be in English, unless we have other accommodations that absolutely must be made for your group. Um, there's no template for the Learnathon lesson plan, and the idea is we want to encourage your, um, we want to encourage you all to be uh, creative in how you display this. This can be on a, a variety of different media. Um, we're going to go deep into detail on this um, in, the, in the next week, but we really want to encourage some um, exciting and out of the box ways to present a learning activity. So. These are the guidelines. I'm not going to go through this because this is, again, a mirror of all the 21st century skills that we've, we've discussed. But this gives a little bit of a guideline on how you'll, how you'll be judged and the categories that you'll be, uh, you'll be judged on. Um, so you'll see that you have to have a product description, talk a little bit about the learning environment, um, show how uh, what evidence, uh, the evidence of learning will be measured, as well as the other uh, categories as well. Um, these are consistent with our 21st century skills that we've been working on with you all, so it shouldn't come as a total shock. But you can think of our Learnathon, once you're divided into your groups, you can think of it as a way to create a new lesson plan. It's just going to be a shorter amount of time. The design of the, the hackathon is based on a lot of, or the Learnathon is based on a lot of uh, hackathons that you may be familiar with in technology. Um, here at Microsoft, we have them all the time where web developers will get together and sit for 24 hours and code. And in this case, we're doing the same thing but with learning activities that can be improved over time as well. Are there any questions for me? Oh, actually, I'm going to hold off on the questions until I finish. I'm so sorry. Um, and you'll have plenty of time for those. I have about 10 minutes for questions for you. Again, here are our themes. Um, the themes are poverty, sustainability, and gender equality. And the criteria, the judging criteria, or rather the judging categories are on the left, the collaboration, knowledge construction, extended learning, use of technology, and self-regulation. All of those are, you'll choose a theme, and you'll be judged on how your learning activity or group's learning activity displays those 21st century skills. So, 
that is really just a taste, a little appetizer for you on the Learnathon. Um, we are going to go into an extraordinary amount of detail next week. They are going to give step by step, um, hour by hour, really details of what the Learnathon will look like for you. Um, we will announce the groups. Um, we will divide you up into groups of about five, um, and we will announce those next next month. And so you will have an opportunity to connect with your group, strategize or not um, with the people that you're going to be working with. Again, this is another opportunity to collaborate and really become uh, partners with folks from other countries and teachers that you've not met before. Um, we will also go into immense detail on the judging criteria. We will have a special guest. Her name is Kirsten Panton, who is our the master of judging at the Global Forum, and she'll give all <coughs> excuse me. She will give all the criteria for um, the Learnathon judging as well. Um, and of course, on our February 5th webinar, we will be going over our third installment of 21st Century Skills. Learn 21st Century Learning Design with Tracy Immel again, where she'll follow up on the homework that she just gave you and um, some of the coding activities that you've discussed and get into further detail on, on 21st Century Learning. So we're, we're packing a lot into webinars and we're packing a lot into the Global Forum. Um, just to, to zoom out a little bit, what we hope that you get from these webinars, from the Global Forum, and from the program in general is professional learning that you can use with your students in, in your classroom soon, if not have not already started using, which I understand you have, as well as collaboration and new ideas and innovative ideas from the best teachers around the world, and a chance for some fun competition um, and a chance to be recognized for your excellent work. So um, I know that it's a lot, and I really appreciate you keeping the details of all this together, but um, as we wrap up our webinar series, your, the logistics of your trip and the year will become, I think, exceedingly apparent and clear, and will hopefully have seated you with the fundamentals of 21st century skill design that can um, help with um, your learn fun project and also all your professional development going forward. So um, I um, that is what I have for you all today, and I, I truly appreciate you um, having sitting through all uh, of my rambling and being able to participate in Tracy's fantastic pr presentation. Um, the one final housekeeping item that I am going to mention is I know that you are all working with your community managers and PIL, PIL partners and learning managers to get your travel arrangements, visa arrangements already set. Many of you are completely done. Others have not quite um, finished that. You know, please, please, please alert your um, community manager as soon as possible. If you have logistic questions on getting to the forum, your hotel and flight, they can help you work with your partners in learning management as oh, well. And, and I see that um, we have questions on, a, a couple of questions about why we created a group. Um, and I want to quickly just address that because it's a very, very important um, piece of what we did. You know, at the Global Forum and in years prior, the teachers have been, educators have come to the forum and we've done an intense professional development workshop for several days. And teachers have really sat and been the recipient. And the major feedback that we get from educators is that there's not enough time to interact with teachers from other countries. And this is both professional and personal in nature, and that they feel it was a missed opportunity when you have people from, you know, 100 different countries in one room to not really glean all that you might be able to from those teachers. So we wanted to formalize this type of collaboration and really force everyone to um, get a little bit out of their comfort zone and work with the other teachers um, that they might not know as well. Okay. And um, unless, Razan, you feel I've missed anything, I would love to answer questions on my Learnathon overview, or if you have any other questions for Tracy or myself um, at this well, time. We if I may add one thing, uh, of Taryn, is um, on your right hand side, you find the little handout icon. It's the icon with the three little pieces of paper. In that, we have added um, something that we call cheat sheet, judges final. And this document is meant to give you a little tick box type of document for when you are going through the Learnathon project with your group members. 
So download that document, go through it. It will give you an indication of what we're looking for in the Learnathon group project. Again, as Taryn said, there is no template for the Learnathon, but that should give you an idea of what we're looking for. We will also add that in the recap email that we will be sending tomorrow. Great, thank you. Are there other questions that are not in the pane? I can open that pane up and see if I can answer them as well. All right, this is very quiet. If there's not any more questions, I can. I was just hoping you'd put the slide back up that showed the three categories. Absolutely, I can, let me just go ahead and flip back there. There you go. That was Brad, I believe. So these are the categories, and then you'll be able to get the names and contact information of your group members after this as well. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 How Hi, we can hear you. This is Ayodele from Nigeria. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. Glad to be on the show this evening. Um, still on um, learning activity for the previous winners at the Global Forum. I mean, 2012 Global Forum in Prague. I want to believe that we have been told that we should prepare a new learning activity, and which has been done.